Welcome to episode 18 of Tornado Facts with Beanrock124 and possibly one of my favorite Tornado Facts with Beanrock124 videos I will be making. Today's episode hits very, very close to home. The 1990 Plainfield, Illinois tornado outbreak that occurred on Tuesday, August 28th, 1990. The violent tornado in Plainfield killed 29 and injured 353. It is the only known F5 or EF5 rated tornado ever recorded in August in the U.S. and the only F5 tornado to strike the Chicagoland area ever. There are no known videos or photographs of the tornado itself because the thing was such a low wedge. A low quarter to maybe half mile wide wedge and it was wrapped in rain nobody could see it. However, in 2011 a video surfaced uh, online showing the supercell that spawned the tornado near NIU University, Northern Illinois University in DeKalb, about half an hour before the tornado uh, touched down near in Oswego. Um, the video was actually very surprising. I'll link it in the videos, this video's description below, or maybe in the top right if I ever decide to do that. The Plainfield tornado was part of a small outbreak that produced several tornadoes in the northern U U.S. and Ontario, Canada. Here's what this thing calls atmospheric conditions, but in reality, it's the meteorological synopsis. And I got a good. And actually, before we start that, I have a um, photo collage, photo album of tornado damage from the tornado. The, this tornado. My grandpa, he worked for the city of Naperville in the 90s, 2000s, and early to mid 2010s. He worked for the city of Naperville, and he had to help clean up Plainfield after it got hit. And he took a lot of pictures of the damage, like, of the church that was hit. We'll get to that in a bit. I don't think the original Plainfield High School is in that. I can't remember. I haven't looked at it in a while. But that's the, not the only story I have of, of this tornado. My second, The second story I have is not, is not to do with my family. It's to, it involves one of my old, one of my old, teachers now she's she was one of my old teachers she periodically watches these videos not these videos the channel itself she lived on route 59 about a mile and I, this, she told me this about a year ago and my memory's fading she lived a mile I think a mile north of Plainfield High School the original one on route 59 or no it was like a quarter mile north like at the intersection, if you if you know what I'm talking about, intersection of Lockport Road and uh, okay, there's no map here, uh, of Lockport Road and Route 59 in downtown Plainfield. She lived there. The tornado was quarter mile to her south, and she remembers it. And her house was luckily not destroyed. She told me that story. I couldn't believe it. I didn't think that somebody I knew was in the path of the tornado, but she described it as such a low wedge she didn't even realize it was a tornado and that's why nobody has a picture or video of it for late august standards october uh where do i get what what i i say for late august standards october 28th i don't know what i'm doing this i'm just excited for this episode august 28th was a particularly warm and humid day temperatures reached into the low 90s uh about about 11 degrees warmer than the normal of 79. But dew points soared into the upper 70s. The presence of such a high dew point did not necessarily predict a severe thunderstorm outbreak. The prior day, similar conditions existed in northern Illinois with the exception of warmer mid-level troposphere. A warmer atmosphere uh, inhibits the rising of surface air through the atmosphere, a requirement for convective precipitation. Precipitation resulting from humid surface ascending to con condense into a cooler atmosphere above to occur. This warmer air aloft can describe, e can describe either or both weak collapse rates, thus instability or a capping inversion. Now I won't read this part because this part looks boring. You can read that for yourself. But the high precipitation supercell that, um, wait, no, I'm going to start here. One of these storms developed supercell supercellular, I can't say it, supercellular Characteristics south of Rockford, steering 30 to 40 degrees to the right, which is southeast. 
prevail uh, of prevailing steering winds. By now, mid-level steering winds had begun to veer, causing a wind profile slightly more favorable for tornado for tornadic devel development. This helped develop a high, precip high precipitation supercell. Um, this this high I cannot speak. I'm so excited. The high precipitation supercell pr uh, produced multiple funnel sightings. One of which was not even five miles from where I live at the Aurora Airport. Uh, there was also reports of hail damage and damaging winds south of Rockford before heading southeast toward Will County and dropped the rain-wrapped quarter mile wide F5. Uh, this is why many in the path did not see the actual tornado but more of a wall of water and dark clouds coming toward them. Which is exactly what my teacher had saw. Had, had, wow. This is exactly what my teacher had seen. As the tornado continued southeast, uh, it produced a 16-mile path of destruction ranging from F1 to F5 intensity. The National Weather Service office, originally in Rosemont near the Rosemont Horizon, uh, servicing all of central and northern Illinois at the time, did not issue a tornado warning until 10 minutes after the tornado had hit Plainfield. Now, one of these tornado uh, tornado facts with Beanrock 124 videos had talked about something similar to this. I, now I can't figure out which one it was. Oh! West Bend, the West Bend, Wisconsin F4, the anticyclonic one. It was like this was like that, where no tornado warning was issued as the tornado was striking Plainfield, similar to West Bend. Uh, using the traditional radar technology at the time until the uh, installa installation of next ray Doppler radar, the storm had a well-defined hook echo, meaning the radar was picking up the wrapping of rain around the circulation of the tornado. Tornado which is also known as a debris ball when it has so much debris. The, okay, great. Oof. Okay, there's no way I'm reading all this. Right, I'll read this first one. I There's no way I can read this. There's that. But I'll, The tornado formed from a supercell thunderstorm, obviously, which initially formed in the vicinity of Janesville south, uh, in south-central Wisconsin shortly after noon. It produced a tornado near... Uh, Patatonica in Winnebago County, about 15 miles to the west of Rockford, that touched down at about 1.42 p.m. The tornado did not last long, however. The, storm, the storm continued to move southeast toward the Aurora area and spawned four short-lived predecessor tornadoes in southeastern Kane County between 2.45 and 3.15 p.m. Within that time period, the storm also struck the Aurora Municipal Airport at about 3.05 Lasting until 3.10, where propeller planes were flipped and the control tower was evacuated, but no injuries were, were reported. Okay, so you're saying if four short-lived predecessor tornadoes touched down in southwestern Kane County, where is it in this list? What? Somebody explain this. Where? Look, two tornadoes in Illinois. What is this? Of course, other websites have it listed, but... Eh. Continuing to the move to the southeast, starting at about 3.15 p.m., the supercell spawned the principal tornado, touching down near Oswego in Kendall County. A lot of people who talk about this tornado say Oswego. I don't know. I've lived in. I've lived near Oswego for pretty much my for my entire life, and I have heard nobody in my area say Oswego. Everybody else outside of okay. Enough with my rant. The tornado rapidly strengthened into an F2 and F3 tornado as it approached Will County. Tornado traveled southeast into Wheatland Township in Will County, not to be confused with the Wheatland, Pennsylvania F5 tornado. Okay, moving on. Near the Wheatland Plains subdivision northwest of Plainfield, that is between 119th and 127th streets. Um, anyways, I've, now I lost track of what I was going to say. At 3.25 p.m., uh, the tornado damaged nearly all the homes in Wheatland Township or Wheatland Plain subdivision where there were several injuries including one child who had to be uh, airlifted to Loyola, Loyola Muni uh, University Hospital in Maywood and later died of injuries. You couldn't take them to a closer hospital? Twelve homes were destroyed in Wheatland Plains. Past, past the neighborhood, the tornado continued to strengthen as it uh, tore across open farmland and reached a five intensity in this area. A narrow swath of destruction or of a, of, yeah, a narrow swath of very intense ground scouring was observed as mature corn crop was completely stripped from the ground, leave, leaving nothing but bare soil behind. Several inches of topsoil were removed as well. As the tornado crossed US-30, a 20-ton tractor trailer was thrown more than half a mile from the road, killing the driver. Where the tornado crossed 
uh, Route 30, that, that would be south of 143rd Street. People in, people in that area know what I'm talking about. The tractor trailer was thrown from more, th from more than half a mile from the road, killing their driver. Three other motorists were killed in this area as their vehicles were thrown from the road. Some cars were picked up and carried considerable, considerable distances through the air. It was determined that the tornado re reached peak strength in this area, and the, F and the F5 rating was based on the extreme ground scouring that occurred. Not because the F5 winds hit a building, it was because of the ground scouring. Beyond this point, the ground scouring became less pronounced as the tornado weakened slightly as it produced, as it approached Plainfield at a high end of F4 intensity. The tornado struck Plainfield at around 3:28 p.m. and around 3:30, the tornado sh directly struck the original Plainfield High School, killing three people, including a science teacher and two maintenance workers. Students had been who had been out practicing for the fall football programs ran into the high school to take shelter a few minutes before the storm hit. After an alarm was pulled by a dean in the main office, the volleyball players preparing for a game in the gym rushed to the nearest door and took shelter in the hallway. It has been reported that as soon as the last player was through the door, a coach quickly closed it, only for it to be immediately ripped back off by the storm. The gym proceeded to fall apart and crash down, which filled the gap in the doorway. They took shelter in the same hallway as the football team, and once the tornado had passed, it was the only hallway left standing in the building. Now... I've been to the new Plainfield High School for a wrestling tournament. And, of course, it's not, it looks nothing the same. I've seen pictures of the original one. Nothing looks the same. So, because uh, there's a field house and an actual gym. From what I'm thinking, where the gym is in the Plainfield High School right now, the, the current Plainfield High School, that might have been where the original one was. It seems like it is, but okay. The tornado then demolished the Plainfield School District Administration Building, where the wife of a custodian was killed. The tornado then crossed Route 59 and ripped into St. Mary Immaculate Church and School, claiming an additional three lives. I've, dri I've driven down that route, um, down to Renwick Road. I don't, even, I don't even recall ever seeing that church. I don't even know if they rebuilt it. They might tell us later. Um, the tornado then claimed another three lives, including the principal of the school, a music teacher, and the son of a, uh, okay. <laughs> and the, and the son of a cook, not the other thing, uh, were killed. Now, uh, 55, 55 homes were destroyed in Plainfield itself, a few of which were swept away. A grocery store east of the high school was badly damaged. Gravestones in the nearby cemetery were toppled. It's that cemetery right at that uh, triangle point of Route 30 and Route 59. It's that cemetery, most likely. And a metal dumpster was found wrapped around the top of a partially debarked tree. There's several pictures of that. My grandpa even has it in his in that photo album I have. Damage in Plainfield was rated at a high as high end F4. Now. I have talked so much about this, there's no way I'm going to finish the rest of this. So anyways, here's the, your tornado table. None, uh, ooh, I almost said afraid it again. Uh, none unrated, 4F0, 4F1, 2F2s, 1F3, no F4, and 1F5 for a total of 12 tornadoes. Now here's your tornado list here. And here's your aftermath, which I'm going to read in its entirely because I'm going to. The, for tornado preparedness, the Plainfield tor uh, Tornado challenged both meteorologists and citizens in terms of tornado preparedness. Substantial safety measures had been enacted in the years following the tornado. Among improvements are frequent and regular tornado drills are performed in schools. After the tornado, meteorologists studying tornado tornadic patterns in the area had found that a major F3 or higher rated tornado strikes Will County about every 12 to 15 years. However, there have been no major tornadoes in the county since 1990. However, an F1 swept through the historic cathedral area in the near west side of Joliet on April 20th, 2004. We will get to that eventually. There, were, there was another uh, EF0 tornado in Plainfield in 2007 that caused damage to a nursing home and a, few, and a few other homes. The twister lasted for three miles and ended up in Bolingbrook. There was also another F0, uh, EF0 oh, excuse me, in uh, Plainfield on June 20th of last year. We all know that date. 
and that was that thing spawned east of Route 59 and nearly hit the Lockport National Weather Service office. So here's the deployment of NEXRAD, the next generation radar. It has been contributed greatly to the ability of meteorologists to recognize tornadic activity. Whereas previous generations of radar could only show reflectivity data and no direct information on air flows, although tornadic supercells and tornadic signatures such as the hook echo and bounded weak echo regions, BWER, were uh, indefiable. NEXRAD contained the ability to detect the wind speed and direction inside the storm. The ability to see rotation inside a storm on both the microscale, tornadic, and mesoscale, supercellular, Measurements had been had allowed forecasters to issue severe thunderstorm and tornado warnings in a more timely fashion and with a higher probability of detection. Forecast criticism now. Even I give some criticism for this tornado. In the months following the tornado, the National Weather Service was heavily criticized for providing no warning of the approaching tornado, just like West Bend, Wisconsin. The NOAA Disaster Survey report was highly critical in the for, uh, in the for, of the forecast process within the Chicago office, as well as coordination with local spotter networks and the preparedness of these groups. Prior to 1990, the National Weather Service office in Chicago, or Chicago Rosemont, was responsible for providing forecasts for the entire state of Illinois. And in, and Chicago, if you don't know, is in the far northeast corner of Illinois. So if you're living down near Cairo, Illinois, yeah, you might be screwed. As the Chicago office was overwhelmed with this workload, no warnings were issued by the office until 2.32 p.m., nearly an hour after the first tornado was sighted southeast of Rockford. A second severe thunderstorm warning was uh, issued almost an hour later at 3.23, but this provided no indication that a tornado was on the ground and did not mention the area where a tornado had been tracked. No tornado warning was issued until after the tornado lifted. Uh, even though the Chicago office had an add-on Doppler improvement that was developed in 1974, that device had been disabled by a lightning strike before the August 28th storm. As a result of the lack of a warning, many meteorologists today refer to the Plainfield Syndrome as the idea that it's better to issue too many warnings and be wrong than to miss one critical warning as the case for the Plainfield Tornado. And people still get mad about that. People still get mad that pe- um, these forecasters issue too many warnings and they're always wrong, most of the time wrong. But if they don't issue enough warnings and there's an F5 on the ground, then people still get mad. So it's like, ugh. It's like you... It makes you want to grab their head and shake it all about. After the 1990 tornado, the National Weather Service uh, reduced the Chicago Rosemont office workload by creating a new office in Rosemont in 93, as well as one in Lincoln in 1995, which was almost destroyed by a mile-wide F3 tornado in 1995. Um, the National Weather Service also allowed offices in the Quad Cities, St. Louis, Indianapolis, and Paducah to issue forecasts for their respective areas. So, that is it for possibly the longest tornado facts with BNR124 video. It's possibly even longer than the 74 Super Outbreak video. But, I just have so much to talk about because it happened so close to where I live. And I have actually a, sto- a few stories to talk to tell about it. So, that is it for episode 18 of Tornado Facts with BNR124. This one being about the 1990 Plainfield Tornado Outbreak. On Tuesday, August 28, 1990. So with that, goodbye.